Welcome to today's Healthline Innovative Webinar from the American Association of Kidney Patients titled Increasing Diversity in Clinical Trials, the Find One Study. My name is Jerome Bailey and I am AKP's Director of Patient Engagement and Advocacy. The content of this program as presented and financial support for this pro webinar is provided by Bayer. As the oldest and largest patient-led kidney patient organization in the U.S., AAKP is proud to host this innovative webinar as a service to the expanding national and global communities of patient consumers and their families. Medical practitioners, researchers, and policymakers who are following innovation and advancements in kidney care and treatment. AAKP is an aggressive supporter of innovation to disrupt status quo kidney care. And we thank you again, Bayer, for sponsoring this important webinar. AAKP's Healthline and Healthline Innovator webinars fall under our Center for Patient Research and Education. We believe patient and care partner education is an integral part of an individual's treatment. And to that end, AAKP is a champion for full patient care choice, the protection of the patient-doctor relationship, and the elimination of artificial barriers and government determinants of health that impede innovation, patient care choice, and access to FDA-approved treatment options. At AAKP, we work to ensure that patients have a central role in the research and development process so that unmet needs are identified and unique patient insights and lived experiences fully inform innovation and the product develop development lifecycle. This includes clinical trials to regulatory action and payment decisions. The field of kidney disease innovation has experienced remarkable progress in recent years, bringing new hope for the development of treatments that address the chronic nature of this illness and its related conditions. As researchers con continue to expand the horizon of medical science, the future of kidney disease treatment looks promising with advancements driven by personalized medicine, cutting edge technologies, and new drugs, devices, and diagnostics that address the needs of this community. The potential to improve outcomes for individuals with kidney disease is vast. Today, we will delve into a groundbreaking study that has the potential to redefine our understanding and approach to kidney disease management. The FIND1 study represents a significant advancement in nephrology, offering new insights and possibly shifting the treatment paradigm for patients. Limited treatment options exist to slow kidney disease progression in individuals with chronic kidney disease and type 1 diabetes, with a lack of focus on this area compared to type 2 diabetes. The FIND1 study is investigating an experimental drug to address this unmet need and potentially improve the outcomes for those with CKD and type 1 diabetes. Patients living with both conditions have the opportunity to contribute to this research and help shape future care for kidney patients. To kick off today's program, I would like to introduce AAKP's Chair of Policy and Global Affairs, Paul Conway. Paul is a passionate advocate for patient-centered care, patient's participation in true shared decision-making, and the use of patient insights in kidney research. As a kidney disease patient himself for 46 years and a 27-year transplant recipient, he has been recognized for his advocacy work with several national awards, including the Presidential Lifetime Achievement Award in 2022. Paul has served in four U.S. presidential administrations, including as Chief of Staff for the U.S. Department of Labor, he has served on multiple federal and nonprofit committees and boards related to kidney health, including as chair of the FDA's Patient Engagement Advisory Committee, the American Board of Internal Medicine Nephrology Specialty Board, and the National Institutes of Health Kidney Precision Medicine Project. In preparation for today's webinar, AAKP conducted an independent flash survey through our Center for Patient Research and Education to understand what would motivate kidney patients to participate in clinical trials. Paul is here to share the key findings from this survey. Paul, I hand the program over to you. 
Thank you very much, Jerome, and thank you so much for your dedication to AAKP. For those who are watching, AAKP is effective because we have a professional staff that includes high quality talent like Jerome Bailey. We appreciate it, Jerome. So this issue of patients participating in clinical trials is critically important to AAKP in the context of innovation and making certain that patients who are most impacted by disease, who suffer the burdens and try to get through life, that their insights are actually reflected in medical innovation for new drugs, new devices, and new diagnostics. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the survey data that we were able to generate going into this webinar about patients and their involvement in clinical trials. I think some of it is rather eye-opening. What we did is we asked if patients have ever been asked to participate in a clinical research trial. We think this is pretty damning as a question. 79% said no only 21% said yes. When we asked who had invited the person to participate in the trial, what you saw was a tight cluster at the top, researchers and scientists, about a third, a kidney specialist, a little over 25%, and a transplant team specialist. So what does this say? It says that researchers and scientists and kidney specialists and transplant specialists play a key role in the current status quo of asking patients to participate. And while that number is low, it shows you how important the role of medical professionals are in asking patients to participate. Of those who did participate, of that 21% who did participate, we asked them if they would do it again, participate in a clinical trial. Over 90% said yes, only 10% said no. This is extremely encouraging because by word of mouth, those who have participated before are very effective ambassadors and spokespeople for why patients should participate in clinical trials. On this slide, you have the data reflecting those patients who had not been asked to participate in a clinical trial. We drilled in to ask them, what was their interest level? And you can see here nearly 60% of patients said they would be interested, but they wanted to know more about what their role would be or what the trial would be about. Also very, very interesting to us is right off the top, nearly a third of patients said if they were asked, they would say, yes, they're interested in participating. So the two takeaways from this are uh, patients are willing to participate and even more patients are willing to participate if it's clearly explained what their role is and what the purpose of the trial is. It's very, very encouraging to us. On this slide, we were trying to determine what could influence those patients that have not participated what members of the community, what stakeholders could be even more influential and have even more success in trying to get patients to participate in clinical trials. Not surprisingly, people said if their nephrologist asked them, nearly 75% said if their nephrologist asked them, they would be interested in participating more. But probably the most important thing that came out of this data set is other patients who have participated in clinical trials have a disproportionate influence in terms of encouraging new patients to participate in trials. I think that's very important for groups like AAKP and other kidney stakeholders to understand. We need to get those patients who have participated in trials out there talking to other patients and demonstrating what it looks like to give back to trial participation. Some of the lesser degree here, U.S. government agencies continue to play a major role in piquing patient interest in clinical trials, as do nurses and clinical staff. But again, the most important thing is patients have disproportionate influence in determining what other patients might participate in clinical trials. On this slide, we asked for those people who had participated in trials and those who had not to identify the one thing that was most important to them in terms of what the greatest risk is of participating in clinical trial research. And the first thing that half the patients said, more than half the patients, is possible risk to overall health and the possibility of side effects. These are very important things to understand because these are the points that uh, those who are doing the recruiting need to address in plain language and upfront in full disclosure. To a much lesser degree, not surprisingly to us as a patient advocacy organization, were concerns about uh, private medical information becoming public. What we've seen at AAKP is patients expect for their information to be held private, but that is not always the determinant factor. It's more a lack of clarity or lack of understanding about risk to health and side effects. On this slide, we ask folks to list uh, in order of importance, uh, the most important information 
influencing their decision to participate in clinical trials on drug development. So again, you see here overwhelmingly over half those who were asked indicate potential risks and benefits. 20% nearly indicate the purpose of the trial study. And then you get into issues like logistics on physical location and that type of thing. But again, right off the top, it's the potential risks and benefits that need to be described and talked about in detail because that influences the decision. This is a question that goes to the question to the point of idealism for patients. We asked those who suffer from kidney disease if they felt that their insights were valued and could be used to improve and advance trials and diagnostic and drug and device innovation and development. Uh, would they help? Would they help the private sector? And what you see here is over 92% of patients indicated that yes, they would. And this slide is a powerful one because it indicates that patients want to do something for people other than themselves. And it's what we know as an advocacy organization and we know as fellow patients that it's very important to try to help those who you may never meet and to make certain that your experiences improve the lives of others through innovation. With that, it's my special honor on behalf of the American Association of Kidney Patients to introduce our guest, Dr. Sylvia Rosa. Dr. Rosa is the president of the National Kidney Foundation, and we know her as a very strong advocate for advancing the patient interests across the realms of policy, science, and innovation. She serves on the faculty of the Harvard Medical School as an associate professor. She's an epidemiologist and a nephrologist and a leading thinker in kidney disease, and especially the voice of patients and the condition of patients that are often overlooked in the Latino and Hispanic community and the African-American community. She brings a level of seriousness and intensity to her work, which we deeply appreciate. She makes certain that all patients, all patients who are impacted by kidney disease are given the opportunity to be included. And that's what we'd like her to talk about today, the importance of the FIND1 trial and what it means for patients that suffer from diabetes, both type one and type two. So Dr. Rosa, without further ado, go right ahead. Uh, thank you very much. It's a delight to be here with uh, you to discuss the FIND1 study and the impact and the importance of uh, patients participating in clinical trials. So thank you very much. So today I will be discussing the FIND1 study, which is a study that involves patients with type 1 diabetes. So the title is Advancing Therapeutic Options for Patients Living with Type 1 Diabetes and Chronic Kidney Disease. So these are my disclosures. So important for this talk is that I am a FIND1 investigator and that a Bayer is sponsoring this talk. So here's the outline. I will be discussing the basics of chronic kidney disease, and I'm sure uh, most of you know it, but we may have members in the audience that are not familiar with chronic kidney disease. Then I'm gonna discuss type one diabetes uh, and the stages of type one diabetes, and then what have been the therapeutic challenges in type one and in patients with chronic kidney disease. And the last item I will discuss is the FIND1 study. So what is diabetes? So diabetes is diagnosed in multiple ways. This is, these are the four ways that it could be diagnosed. For some, it's just checking an A1C. If it's more than 6.5, you met the criteria. It could be diagnosed by fasting blood glucose of more than 126, or um, you could have a two-hour um, oral glucose tolerance test. Um, that is another way. Or if you have classic symptoms, and high blood sugars, usually above 200, then that would make the diagnosis. So how do we diagnose type one? So there's different types of diabetes. Type one and type two are the most common. It, type one diabetes is suspected um, when it's an autoimmune disease. So the first thing that uh, people get tested is the uh, autoantibodies. And I listed here on the right, four of the most common autoantibodies that are tested. So if any of those are positive, you, you have a type one diabetes. Sometimes depending on age, the, those antibodies are no longer detected. So if you're less than 35, they, usually look for other 
causes of um, sort of diabetes, and they measure something called the C-peptide. And if it's elevated, um, then you look for, you could have type two. If it's low, then you definitely have type one. If you're more than 35, it, it's, it's a, again, testing C-peptide, et cetera, but you could have type two uh, if the C-peptide is elevated. So that's how we diagnose type one. And it's estimated that about 1.4 million Americans have type 1 diabetes. So here's how we classify. There is a, a multiple stages, and then there's the stage where you're asymptomatic. That's stage 1 and stage 2. In stage 1, only the autoimmunity is positive, but your sugar control is fine. So there's no alteration in sugar control. In stage 2, the autoimmunity is is positive, so those autoantibodies are positive, but you, if they test you, your sugar will be altered. But again, you're asymptomatic, you don't know about it. And in stage three, you're already symptomatic, you have the autoantibodies, and you have the sugar alterations. Chronic kidney disease, as you know, it's very common among U.S. adults. It's estimated that one in seven, or about 15% of the U.S. population, that's where you get the 37 million Americans, are estimated to have chronic kidney disease. They, unfortunately, nine out of 10 do not know that they have chronic kidney disease because similar to diabetes, the early stages are completely asymptomatic. Again, this is very important. That's why it's so important to screen if you're at risk. Chronic kidney disease is very important to diagnose because it is among the diseases that is growing in the predictor years of life lost. So here's an estimate from um, this um, journal about years of life lost between 2016 and 2040. You can see that chronic kidney disease is one of those diseases where the years of life are lost. But it's also very important to note that heart disease is also very high and our patients are at high risk of heart disease too. So if you add all of those, it, the predicted years of life lost is quite high. So how do we screen and diagnose chronic kidney disease? It's very easy. If you have type 1 diabetes, it's estimated that you should wait five years to start an annual check of your for chronic kidney disease. And for type 2, it's at the time of diagnosis. And some of you may wonder why, but that's because type 1, we usually know exactly when you were early on when you had a the disease because those patients usually require insulin. And patients with type 2 can have a more insidious, longer process. So when they're diagnosed, in general, it's estimated that they've had diabetes for about 5 to 10 years before they're diagnosed. So that's why when somebody's diagnosed with type 2, we screen already for chronic kidney disease. And how do we do that? The important thing is to test both a blood test and the urine test. The urine is used to measure albumin in the urine which is something that leaks from the filters and we can measure it in the urine. And then the blood test is to measure creatinine, which helps us plug it into a formula with your gender and your age, and it tells us what your kidney function is. So it's quite important to know that if you have albumin in the urine greater than 30, or if your GFR is less than 60, you have chronic kidney disease. The definition of chronic kidney disease is what is here is an abnormality of kidney function or structure that is present more than three months. We all know that sometimes people develop acute kidney injury for due to a disease or a medication, etc. If they recover, then they had acute kidney injury. But for chronic kidney disease, you have to have that high albuminuria or that low GFR for more than three months. And here you can see in what we call the heat map, the uh, depending on your level, so the lower your level of kidney function and the higher the albumin in the urine, the more at risk you are of um, kidney failure. So here you can see the red is very high risk, uh, orange is high risk, and a yellow would be moderate risk. So why do we care about both GFR and albuminuria? So we care because it's associated with 
all kinds of things that are not good. So one of them is all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality. So in the left two slides, you will see that if cardiovascular mortality increases as your GFR decreases. And same thing with uh, all-cause mortality. So GFR below 60 is, is associated with an increased risk of both all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality. And, but very important too, is that in levels below 30, that's also associated with increased risk of cardiovascular mortality and all-cause mortality. So you can see that the higher the albuminuria, the more increased risk there is. Here you can see that the prevalence of diabetes in patients with chronic kidney disease is increasing over time. Here are different time periods, blue, red, gray, and the latest time period is um, in green. And you can see that for any cause of kidney disease, it's going up, particularly in the early stages. Um, and then it's less often in the lower stages, but it's not, not necessarily a good thing. It just means that our patients with diabetes are likely dying even before they reach um, kidney failure. So here we're going back to type one, and you can see that in, in this study, they estimated the growth of um, type one patients based on an incident study that they were doing, and they estimated what it would look like for 2060. And you can see that the majority of the growth during that time period will be in Hispanics and non-Hispanic blacks. And you can see that more or less there is growth in the non-Hispanic whites, but it's not as dramatic as it is for Hispanics and non-Hispanic whites. So here, unfortunately, there's not an exact uh, prevalence uh, registry for patients with type 1 diabetes, but this is an estimate based on Anne Haines' data of how the percentage of people with type 1 diabetes and chronic kidney disease in the U.S. And it's estimated that it is 60 percent of the patients with type 1 diabetes and chronic kidney disease are white and about 18 percent are black and Mexican-American about 2%, and other Hispanic 9, 7% for a total for Hispanic of 9%. It's estimated that they have a GFR of 57. That's about a stage three. And then the protein in the urine on average is 89. And remember, we discussed that more than 30 is considered abnormal. So in general, they, they have a high levels. And so here is another study in type one patients where being of African-Caribbean ethnicity is a predictor of who's going to progress to chronic kidney disease. So you can see that the sort of yellowish mustard color is the African-Caribbean individuals, and the sort of um, gray color is the non-African-Caribbean. Um, and you can see that the individuals in the mustard color uh, are at higher risk. Again, it takes years to develop chronic kidney disease. So that's why we see the difference, uh, you know, after let's say a year eight, you can see really increasing the uh, hazard ratio of um, chronic kidney disease. So unfortunately, there's not a lot that has been tested for individuals with type one diabetes and at risk for chronic kidney disease. So you may remember the DCCT EDIC trial that's from the like mid, 2010s or so, where they this they were able to prove that intensive glycemic control, so that means that your A1C was less than seven, was associated with uh, improved um, microvascular. Those are retinopathy and kidney disease, so less complications. And then in the late 1993, we had the Captopril study. So those were the two studies that have shown a positivity for treatment of kidney function in patients with type 1 diabetes. But these are very old studies. Here we see that even though um, A1C is so important for the management of chronic kidney disease, unfortunately, um, Hispanics and African Americans are more likely to have uncontrolled A1C. And you may wonder why that is. So that's in part because they're usually less likely to have technology. Um, 
they're more likely to have insurance that does not cover the pump, et cetera. They are more likely, because of this, is, is they end up in the emergency room more often and more likely to have more admissions. Um, so all of those things affect who will develop chronic kidney disease. Of course, if we know that a glycemic control is so important, Hispanics and African Americans are less likely to have access to this um, tools to control their blood sugar, then they're also at increased risk for chronic kidney disease. So here are the um, guidelines for the diabetes management in chronic kidney disease. This was a consensus from both the American Diabetes Association and the Kidney Disease Improvement Global Outcomes, or KDGO. And you can see that the items in blue are for both uh, patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And the new medications that we all have heard of, the SGLT2s, the GLP1s, and finerenone that have shown kidney benefit are in green, but none of those have been approved for patients with type 1 diabetes. So even though they've been shown that they're effective for type 2 patients, the studies on type 1 patients have not been done. So today I'm going to talk about um, finerenone, which is a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. And so first I was going to discuss how mineralocorticoid receptors affect the brain, blood vessels, the heart, and the kidney. So in the kidney, they um, produce aldosterone decreases potassium and may be a component or an important factor of driving proteinuria and glomerular injury and causing vas vasoconstriction. In the heart, they produce a scarring in the kidney known as fibrosis and damage of the, um, of the blood vessels, um, causing what we call inflammation of the blood vessels and they activate the sympathetic nervous system. All of that leads to increased hypertension. They're more, if aldosterone is high, it increases heart failure. And again, all that scarring in the kidney also leads to chronic kidney disease. So as we discussed, our patients they are more frequently have uh, diabetes, heart disease, chronic kidney disease, heart failure. That's usually, um, combination, unfortunately, that our patients commonly have. And that, in part, could is secondary to the overactivation of this mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. And a, I already explained sort of the inflammation, the oxidative stress, the damage of the blood vessels leads to a more damage in the kidney. So in patients with type 2 diabetes, this is a type 2 diabetes study, a finerenone decrease a kidney failure and death from, from kidney disease. So in this study, there was a composite primary outcome and composite means that they took many of the outcomes and just combined them. So here, it, the outcome was kidney failure. So anybody that went on dialysis or got transplant, but they also looked at a decrease in the kidney function, as we know the GFR, that was at least 40% or death from a renal cause. And so that was the primary composite outcome and patients that were on finerenone and had type 2 diabetes and were on a RAS blockade, so they had to be on ACE inhibitors or ARB, they had an 18% reduction in um, kidney failure or the kidney composite outcome compared to those individuals that were on placebo. So placebo is the sort of the inactive medication. So those that were on finerenone did better. And again, I want to highlight that, yes, type 1 patients are not exactly the same as type 2 patients. Type 1 patients tend to be younger, so that's why the effects of aging are mostly seen in patients with type 2. And patients with type 2 also tend to um, have dyslipidemia and more insulin resistance than patients with type 1 diabetes. So that's why even though they're similar and under the microscope sometimes they look similar, um, the patients may not be the same. So that's why it's important uh, to do the studies in type 1 patients to see if the medication really works for type 1 patients because we cannot say, oh, just because it worked for type 2, it's going to work for type 1. So that leads us to the FINE 1 study. And these are all the countries, it's a global study. We estimate that about 20% of the patients will be from the United States. 
and you'll see they are listed are all the countries that are participating in the study. So in the United States, you can see um, here all the points, all the sites, and there are more um, being recruited, uh, but you can see all the sites um, where there are uh, clinical sites where they're recruiting patients for this study. And we, as a study, are very interested in recruiting about, would like about 30% of patients to be from uh, Hispanics or African Americans, because we want to make sure that it represents the U.S. population. So this is a scheme of uh, what the trial looks like. There's a 14-day window for screening, and that's when they look at, you know, is your sugar under control? Is your GFR low? Did you have albumin in the urine? So that you meet the criteria for the study. Are you an adult, et cetera? And, um, and then people are going to be randomized to phenerenone 10 or 20 based on their GFR or the matching placebo, which as, as I said, is the inactive medication. If patients, the study is only for six months. Because there's so much data on type two, this study is only six months just to make sure that the benefits that we're seeing early on for the patients is also seen in patients with type one diabetes. So these are the inclusion criteria. So obviously patients have to be adults, so more than 18. You have to have type 1 diabetes because it's a type 1 study. By definition, um, they want to be, these are patients that started insulin within one year of diagnosis. Your sugar control should be adequate, so less than 10%. Uh, you know, your A1C needs to be less than 10%. And then obviously you have to have chronic kidney disease. So you have to either have a GFR of 25 to 90. And in this study, they're looking for patients that have albuminuria greater than 200, but less than 5,000. And that is because the endpoint is changes in albuminuria. So they would like to be have individuals that are higher risk. The potassium has a expected potassium is less than 4.8 and to be on a stable ACE inhibitor or ARB because ACE inhibitors and ARB are the standard of care for diabetic kidney disease. So why is it important that uh, we talk about who participates in clinical trials today? And that is because most of the US trials in clinicaltrials.gov do not report race or ethnicity. We are not able to know who's participating in those clinical trials. But when they looked at it, it looks that 43% reported results. It, they did not have any race or ethnicity data. So we don't know who those patients are that participated. So we want for chronic kidney disease, for example, Hispanics and African-Americans are overrepresented in the individuals that get the disease. So it would be very important to make sure that the patients that have the disease or at a higher risk for kidney failure, that they also participate in the studies. Um, so even though uh, the certain diseases are overrepresented by certain groups, sometimes in the clinical trials, they do not look like reality. So on average, most of the patients, almost 80% of all clinical individuals that participate in clinical trials are white. 10% are black, 6% are Hispanic, and 1% are Asians. This is all clinical trials. And here I give you an example of the COVID-19. So COVID-19, as you all know, the rate of hospitalization for Blacks and Hispanics was almost three to four times that of white people. And the rate of death for Blacks and Hispanics was also higher than for white people. But you can see here that when it came to um, who participated in clinical trials, and in this study, they looked at Boston, New York, and Minneapolis. And you can see that even though um, I'm going to show you sort of the clearer numbers. I don't know if you, you see Boston. Um, so the light, lighter, I don't know what color that is, purple, let's say, um, where it says 38%. Those are the individual cases for black individuals in Boston. But unfortunately, when they went to do the clinical trials, only 23% of the population was black in the, let's say, Boston studies. And the, in Minneapolis, it was even more dramatic. 33% of the individuals um, 
had a COVID, but only 5% of the clinical trials in Minneapolis had individuals that were black. Um, and you can see differences in the other way too here. Hispanics for both Boston and Minneapolis were below what they should have been recruited. But then in New York, they made up 51% of the clinical trials compared to they made up 33% of the cases. So it can go both ways. So why is the representation so important? It is important because there is a principle of justice when we do clinical trials. We want to make sure that the people that are affected by the disease get the benefit from whatever medication is being studied. And also it may affect the science too, because we may say, oh, this drug works really well. And then when you go try it in clinical uh, care, it ends up that the effectiveness is way lower because it, for whatever reason, it works differently for different groups. So we want to make, make sure that that, that. And then there's another thing that's very important or any aspect that's very important that it, I think it negatively affects the trust of society if research does not represent the people that have the disease. So uh, if we don't participate in trials, it does, it may contribute to health inequities. And so as, as um, organizations and researchers, we work really hard to ensure that the participants in clinical uh, trials represent the demographic and the socioeconomic background of individuals with the condition. So this is just to re reiterate that diverse clinical trials provide the opportunity to ensure drug efficacy for patients everywhere. So in conclusion, um, chronic kidney disease is very common. It is more common in non-white individuals and non-white individuals are more likely to end up in kidney failure. Lack of trials for patients with type 1 diabetes and chronic kidney disease are of concern. Now we have a medication that is oral that has been shown to um, be beneficial for patients with type 2 diabetes. And now we're trying to make sure that it also works for patients with type 1 diabetes. Successful recruitment is a team effort. It's the, as you saw from the presentation from um, Paul Conway, it's very important that not only that the physicians are involved, the nurses are involved, and the whole community is involved in recruiting for clinical trials. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Rosa. And I tell you what, um, your reputation for caring for people and the individual is key. And I think as we're talking about type 1 and type 2 diabetes, understanding that uh, type 1 patients in type 1 trials um, have been actually limited in the solutions for type 1 patients have been limited. And what we're trying to do here is change that dynamic. I was wondering if you could tell us, based on your work at uh, the Jocelyn um, Center, to, for the people that are watching this and that may not be familiar with a type 1 patient, if, it's occur if it occurs at a younger age, what types of people are we talking about? What types of things are they involved in? Uh, what's going on with their life? Put, it, put a face on a type 1 patient for us. Yes. So that's why I say that it's very important to look for those autoantibodies because unfortunately we're seeing a growth of type 2 diabetes in children, particularly Hispanic and African Americans are also at yet getting type 2 diabetes at a younger age. So that's why oh. testing for the autoantibodies, it's not like before. We used to say, oh, if they're young, they probably all have type 1. Nowadays, you can't just say that. You really have to test for the autoantibodies. Uh, because the treatment is different. If you have type 1, you really need insulin right away. If you have type 2, you can use other medications. So it's very important to make the di correct diagnosis. Okay. And then as we're working towards the goal of getting a higher recruitment level, uh, you've talked about this in terms of the medical community um, and working with patient advocates. But are there other uh, groups that are out there in society that we should look at as advocates and as medical professionals to raise awareness of this trial uh, and that patient advocates that are watching across the country, our ambassadors, NKF ambassadors, could be reaching out to to educate and ask them to talk about this. I'm thinking of things like the faith community, other communities, the business community. 
what types of things have you seen that work well in Boston and other places? Uh, sure. To be honest, uh, for clinical trials, our best ambassador are the patients. The patients, as you noted, that have participated in trials, uh, they're great ambassadors because they know about the care. And, um, you know, when you participate in a clinical trial, it's very important to, as you noted, to know the risk and benefits. Uh, in a study like FIND1, this is an FDA approved medication that works for type 2. So the risk uh, benefit ratio for somebody um, that is, let's say, more risk averse, uh, this might be the right study for them. Some patients want to participate in trials that um, are more risky. So let's say um, it's medication that is not FDA approved, but that's not for everybody. And so we do, as you noted, we do tend to ask all our, our patients to participate in a clinical trial and we get a lot of no's, but we get some yeses. And so that's how we um, are able to recruit for our trials. Uh, but it I does, know. I'm yeah, sorry, I, I to say that when you participate in clinical trials, it does represent a certain commitment from the patient because they do have to travel sometimes once a month or sometimes twice a month to come to the center. And there's always blood and urine to be given because we want to make sure that they're safe. So for some patients that they don't, they are um, not willing to do that or unable or lack of transportation, et cetera. But that's why pharma and the investigators provide a, some, a, let's say, transportation reimbursement or are able to um, make accommodations for time. So we see patients sometimes as early as 7 p.m. so that they can do the clinical visit and then go to work because we don't want to affect their lives so much. Yeah, and I know you're very passionate about uh, involving people. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about is this. Uh, in terms of national policy, national bipartisan policy over the past five years has been really focused on trying to take care upstream and prevent suffering. Uh, with the advent and with the start of this trial, how has it been uh, as a medical professional to be able to save for a population that has been left out of that conversation? Um, with some of our diabetes patients. How, how has it made you feel as a professional to know that we're actually ex able to extend that promise of taking care further upstream if we can get more folks into this trial and see how we do in trying to show the efficacy? Sure. So I'll answer your question in two ways. One, I feel very strongly that in the US there should be a screening indication for all patients at risk for chronic kidney disease. Right now, um, the US Preventive Service Task Force is looking into giving a screening indication. And the, we, I believe that everybody that's at risk, that means anybody with hypertension, anybody with diabetes, anybody with obesity, anybody with heart disease, anybody with a family history of kidney disease, they should be tested. I think for me, that's the most important because we can have the most wonderful medications, but if you do not know that you have kidney disease, you will never be treated. And so therefore that's the very first step. I do believe that patients with kidney disease have been left behind from clinical trials because our patients, you know, have other complex diseases. They got kidney disease because they got diabetes or they got kidney disease because they had hypertension or had other disease. So they tend to have to be more complex. And I think that industry was shying away um, from, from uh, looking into this area. But I think that that or I hope I, that is over because we have seen the tremendous amount of um, positive trials in kidney disease because now they're doing the trials. So that's why I think there's tremendous hope for patients with kidney disease. Uh, and hopefully they will, that in the future, or I, I feel that we're there now, that we are working towards preserving kidney function and we're not working towards uh, making kidney failure treatments. I think we're working towards preserving their own kidney function so that our patients will live with their own kidneys and do not need dialysis and transplant. That is my hope for the future. Thank you very much, Dr. Rosa. And since you brought this up, we're such strong allies on policy issues and their implications for people. 
I wanted to delve back into this issue of the United States Preventative Services Task Force for a second and ask you, in terms of reducing the burdens on patients and societies, can you talk a little bit more about why it's so important to screen people early? Sure. Um, sure. Uh, now we know that nine out of 10 people with kidney disease don't know they have kidney disease. And what is important is that once they know they have kidney disease, they're more likely to be treated. They're more likely to have a diagnosis in their chart and people are more likely to take care of their kidneys. Um, you know, when you have kidney disease, some of the medications need to be dosed differently. You're at greater risk of acute kidney injury. So you have to have, be more hydrated, for example, when you have a procedure, et cetera. You have to be, you know, you have to treat those kidneys with tender loving care. So, uh, so knowing the diagnosis is very important. And now, as, as I mentioned, and you saw, there's at least three or four new medications that at least for treatment of diabetes are indicated and, um, and patients should ask for them because we want them to live with their own kidneys for years and years to come. Great, thank you, Dr. Rosa. And before I throw this back over to Jerome, I wanted to ask you one final question. In your role on the faculty at Harvard Medical and also in some of the other roles with the Jocelyn Center, and also uh, in terms of your work with the Latino uh, Kidney Center, can you tell me what the impact on people is of innovation and access issues? Because these are also issues that uh, we work very hard with NKF and other kidney allies to advance. And you've been a true champion of making certain that patients have participation in innovation and access to it. Yeah, so for example, uh, right now, uh, I'll give you an example. Those those. Uh, glucose continuous glucose monitoring they have been shown to help patients maintain their a1c at a better control and as i mentioned good a1c control prevents kidney damage unfortunately it's not available for everybody because some insurance cover it some don't some have restrictions some don't so it depends you know you you cannot even fathom that a depending on your insurance, you will get a different treatment, even though the treatment is indicated. And, um, and so for me, that is a struggle. And we do try to help patients um, get the medicine that they need. Um, but sometimes it is hard. Thank you very much, Dr. Rosa. And again, it's a complete pleasure for us to have you participating in one of our webinars. And I know that with your encouragement and with your alliances with us in the National Kidney Foundation, the American Association of Kidney Patients, we will be able to increase enrollment and participation in clinical trials like the FINE one and others. Now what I'd like to do is go ahead and pass over to Jerome Bailey. He'll give you folks details on what you need to do in order to access more information about this webinar and related information on clinical trials. Jerome, go right ahead. All right. Thank you, Paul. Uh, if anyone watching has additional questions uh, for our speakers or about today's webinar uh, that we were unable to get to, please email us at info at aakp.org, noting the webinar title and the email subject line. We are excited to tell you a little bit more information about the Find One study. Researchers are investigating whether Finerone is more effective than a placebo in slowing the progression of kidney disease when added to standard care. Researchers will assess the drug's effectiveness by measuring protein levels in the urine, and an important marker of kidney health. To be eligible for the study, you must be 18 years or older, have type 1 diabetes, and have been diagnosed with, your, with CKD or elevated protein levels in your urine by your healthcare team. As part of the study, the researchers uh, will collect blood and urine samples, monitor vital signs, including blood pressure and heart rate, perform a physical examination, including height and weight measurements, evaluate your heart using an electrocardiogram, and conduct pregnancy tests for women of child childbearing potential. For more information, use the QR code or bit.ly link on your screen to visit the trial website. Uh, there you can download materials to discuss with your family and healthcare provider, take a pre-screener or see if you qualify and find a study site near you. 
If you are not already a member of AAKP, we encourage you to join. AAKP offers free membership to patients and their family members, as well as living kidney donors. To become a free member, join online at aakp.org forward slash join or by phone at 1-800-749-2257. To receive all the benefits of membership, please be sure to include your email address when signing up. As an AAKP member, you will be notified about all of AAKP's upcoming events, the latest in our educational program series, and when opportunities arise where your opinions and experiences are needed to help inform innovation, advance care, and make a meaningful impact to improve lives. We encourage you to respond to our flash surveys and other engagement opportunities to help us elevate the independent patient voice and change status quo kidney care. You will also receive a digital subscription to our, bi to our bi monthly magazine, AAKP Renal Life, and you can select to receive any of our five different electronic newsletters, all for just signing up. We also invite you to check out our blog and read some great articles and patient profiles, profile stories, and follow us on social media for the latest news and to keep up on what's trending. AAKP is dedicated to helping kidney patients across the disease spectrum understand their condition and take control of their health care. We are proud to offer a variety of resources for both patients and care partners by visiting our website at aakp.org and clicking on the AAKP store button at the top of the homepage. You can find a variety of educational brochures and online tools to order or download free of charge, including titles such as the Pocket Guide to Managing Kidney Disease, or Understanding What It Means to Have Protein in Your Urine Brochure. You can also order materials by phone. AAKP has more exciting events planned for the rest of 2024, including our AAKP 49th Annual National Patient Meeting, taking place September 25th through the 27th at the Rosen Plaza Hotel in Orlando, Florida. This year marks our return to an in-person event for those comfortable participating in an in-person meeting while also offering an interactive experience for those tuning in virtually. The National Patient Meeting is the largest kidney patient conference in the U.S. with a growing international audience, features a diverse lineup of speakers crossing all sectors of the kidney community, an exhibit hall allowing participants to engage with various kidney-related companies and organizations, and various other networking activities. And our seventh annual policy summit is scheduled to take place November 20th at the National Press Club in Washington, DC, and will also allow for virtual participation. Registration for both events is now open. And finally, you can also visit our YouTube channel to watch a number of great presentations and webinars, all available on demand from our 2023 events and programs, as well as 2024 programs as they occur. Once again, we'd like to thank Bayer Pharmaceutical for sponsoring today's Healthline Innovator webinar. And thank you to Dr. Silvia Rosas and Paul Conway. To our audience, thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your day.